Well, hey everybody, I want to say welcome or welcome back. It's Pastor Mitchell here and so glad you've chosen to join us today for Church Online. And if you are brand new with us, we'd love to know that you're watching today. Go ahead and leave us a comment below and let us know you're here. Or you can send me an email at mitchell.dewear at gmail.com. I'd love to be able to connect with you in that way. Now, just a few things I want to bring to your attention before we get right into today's message. First of all, on Wednesdays at 6.30 here at APBC, we continue to meet for a midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. would encourage you uh, to come out for that. Now, of course, we all know as well, this coming Tuesday is the first day of school for students uh, in our community. And so uh, we as a church are going to continue uh, to serve breakfast as the volunteer base of the breakfast program at DHCS. Uh, if you are interested in helping out with that. We're looking for a couple more volunteers who uh, will be able to spend part of their morning at the school serving breakfast to students as they come in off the bus. If you're able to contribute one morning a week to that or even as, as a spare uh, for someone who can't be there, please contact Carolyn DeWare uh, so that uh, you can let her know that you're interested and she can give you all the details as to how you can go about volunteering for the breakfast program at Drumlin Heights. Now, there are a few announcements related to Camp Penile. I want to let you know many of you heard last week uh, that Renee Robichaud is going to be the new managing director at Camp Penal starting sometime in August. Uh, he has served at Camp Shiktehawk up in New Brunswick as well as Louisville Baptist Church in Moncton and he's going to be arriving here so please be praying for Renee and for Camp uh, as he begins his role there this fall. As well, uh, this Saturday, September the 12th, from 9 to 11.30, there is a silent auction taking place on Cedar Lake, uh, right out there at Camp Penal on the property. And so I want to encourage you to head out there to support Camp Penal through that fundraiser, as well as pick up some great items from the silent auction along the way. Now, a couple needs uh, from Camp Penal at this time. One, they're looking for a four-wheeler. Uh, as well, they're looking for someone with a specific skill set to be able to lay tile in the kitchen. So if you have or you know someone who has a four-wheeler uh, that you'd be willing to donate to Camp Camp Penal for their use. Um, that would be fantastic. Or if you can or know someone who can lay tile, uh, certainly contact me, let me know, and I'll pass on that information uh, to camp uh, so that uh, they can be aware of that need being filled in that way. And so those are just a few things from Camp Penal. And then finally, I just want to mention today, uh, we are so excited that starting sometime this fall, uh, Mark Nickerson is going to be coming to serve as Next Generation's pastor here at APBC. We want to continue to pray for he and Amanda and their family uh, as they work to sell their house and to find a spot uh, here in our area and our communities uh, to be able to live. So I encourage you to continue to pray for those things. Of course, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly. Now, I hope that today's message both encourages and inspires you in taking your next step in trusting in and following Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. The sun. And my 
time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his voice.
Well, about a year ago, uh, we started working our way through the book of Exodus, and we had kind of uh, started at the very beginning of that book and had all through the fall uh, encountered kind of the first half of that book, the first 15, 16 chapters, and then uh, we had a few interruptions along the way with Christmas and things like that. We kind of got back into it at the beginning of the year, and then uh, March happened, and we kind of set the whole series aside for a time, and now as we come back into the beginning of September, I wanted to reorganize orient our focus back to uh, the book of Exodus, because I think there's some really helpful and important things for us uh, in the middle of that book that uh, will help form us spiritually as we continue to consider what it means to trust and follow Jesus. And so uh, we're going to be today starting in chapter 30 of the book of Exodus. And so if you've got a Bible with you and you want to follow along, that's where we're going to be. We'll have some of the verses up on the screen today, uh, but that's where we're going to be. Exodus chapter 30 is where we're going to begin. And just to give you a little bit of context, because Exodus is a huge book with all kinds of things happening in it, just kind of the 30,000 foot view that brings us to where we're at is that, that God's people were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. And God speaks to Moses, who was raised in Pharaoh's house, but um, ran into some legal trouble, ran away. And God speaks to Moses and says, I am sending you uh, to deliver my people. And so God sends Moses back into Egypt. Uh, he has a confrontation, many confrontations with Pharaoh. God displays his great might and power and leads his people out of slavery in Egypt and brings them across the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai. And uh, as God has brought them into that space, uh, he says to them, look, I have made a promise to Abraham. Abraham. I'm the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I made a promise to Abraham that, that his descendants were going to become a great nation one day. And you, as his descendants, are the nation I am building. And so I'm going to make a covenant with you. And so God's people find themselves at the base of the, uh, of the Mount, of Mount Sinai. And as they are there, God speaks to them out of the cloud and the fire. It's a great, terrifying experience. But, uh, but God says, this is the covenant I'm making with you. There's obligations on your part. I'll uphold my end of the deal. Um, but there's certain things I expect of you as well. Uh, part of that covenant arrangement is what we call the Ten Commandments. And there's various other laws uh, and things that are a part of that uh, that kind of form their identity as a nation and as a holy set apart people that belong to God. Um, but, but then we get into a few other things. And what's kind of led into where we are now is God has been given, giving Moses instructions about how he is going to dwell or tabernacle with his people in a way that he has not before. And so so there's these instructions that are given to Moses about how to construct this outdoor sanctuary that, that involves a tent and a curtain and, and all kinds of things. And so, so God has given Moses instructions about what this tent is to look like, what it's to be made of. The, the instructions are very specific, very detailed. Uh, there's some of the furniture uh, that God gives Moses instructions about. Is this how you're to construct it? This is what it's to be built of. Things like the Ark of the Covenant, which you've probably heard of if you've ever watched Indiana Jones uh, or studied any history, uh, as well as like the, the lampstand that goes in there, um, the altar that's going to be uh, built out of bronze that sits in the outer court of the tabernacle. There's this tent of meeting in the middle of it. Um, there's, there's divided up into holy places, a most holy place. Um, there's, there's all these in, just specific details, instructions that God gives to Moses. And where we left off last is God is still speaking to Moses about the pattern and the template uh, that he's giving him. So there hasn't been anything done on it yet. It's just Here's the template. Here's the pattern. Here's what you are to do. Here's the blueprints. I'm, I'm going to send you down and you're, you're to get going on the construction of this. And so, so again, just to affirm the theme that, that God is saying, I am going to dwell with or be present with my people in a spe specific and particular way. And, and, and there is going to be a way into my presence that is also detailed and specific. And there's going to involve priests and sacrifices and lots of uh, ritual things that, that need to take place for you to enter into my presence. But, but God is making a way for people to, to enter enter into his own presence. And so, uh, so what we left off with were the instructions about keeping the, the lamps burning within the tabernacle all the time the priests were to do that. And what we said was is that, um, that 
That, that was, in some ways, God's way of saying, look, the light is always on. I am always home. Keep the flame burning. Now, today, we're going to get into a few more of the detailed instructions. Um, because, again, nothing's really been done uh, on the construction of this yet. There's just the plans. Uh, but there's a few other things that, that God's going to give to Moses, uh, again, as the blueprints that he's to accomplish. And at the end of those instructions, we're going to bring a few things into focus, specifically for today, uh, as it's Labor Day weekend. And, and uh, what we have here uh, out of the book of Exodus, I think, is going to be super helpful for us as we consider uh, work and rest. And so that's what we're getting into today. So with that introduction, uh, let's just pick up uh, chapter 30, uh, starting at verse 11. And here's uh, what God says to Moses. His Lord says to Moses, <clears throat> when you take the census of the people of Israel, they each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord. And when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 gerhas. Half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. And the rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than the half shekel. And when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money for the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meaning that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. And so and so again, God says to Moses, look, when you count the people for a census, um, there's usually a couple of reasons why census, censuses would be taken. Uh, one is so that there would be an estimate of the numbers of the size that we have for war and for, for military uh, efforts. And not only that, but for taxation purposes as well. And so God says to Moses, look, whenever you take a census, all the males aged 20 and up that are going to be counted, they have to pay a one-time ransom. And the amount of that ransom is a half shekel. Now this is what the half shekel looks like and uh, it weighed about five grams and the value in today's currency of a half shekel would be about five dollars and so uh, less than the cost of a grande latte at Starbucks uh, was the price of uh, what was supposed to be contributed toward the function of the tent of meeting uh, when a census was taken. Now that seems to be uh, quite trivial. It seems like a trivial thing Thing. Like, why the $5 fee? Um, and again, we have it explained here for us. Um, it wasn't, uh, I guess, uh, it, it wasn't so much like you had to make a payment and, and whatever, you know, as you think of like membership dues or something like that. Uh, it was more to the fact of this, that, that it was to remind them that they belonged to the Lord and that it was the Lord himself that had brought them out of Egypt and out of slavery. And not only has he brought them out of one thing, but he's now bringing them near to himself. And so, so, so the emphasis of this whole thing is that their lives belong to God. And so, so that's the command that's given. You continue to read, and there's a few more instructions that are given. There's going to be a little bit of reading here, so just kind of stick with us as we read through this description. Well, I want you to see just how detailed uh, these instructions are. Uh, and as we kind of make our way through, we'll begin to make some application again. So starting at verse 17, now we read, The Lord said to Moses, you shall also make a basin, of, a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. And when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come out near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering for the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. Again, there's going to be this piece of furniture uh, that's going to be set up, and it's this, this big basin uh, that's, that's made out of bronze. It's going to sit in kind of the outer courtyard between the, between the altar and the tent of meeting, and it's going to be a space when, whenever the priests come out of the tent or they're going into the tent, that they're going to be able to wash themselves up, um, they're kind of their feet and their hands, uh, before they enter uh, into the place of their service. And so, so, so this is, again, part of the, the ritual of the function of the priest within the tabernacle. 
Bible. And again, the, the emphasis and the reminder is so that, uh, that the priests would be reminded uh, that they too need to be cleansed um, when functioning in the presence of God. That, that there's this symbol of washing and atoning for and taking care of impurity and sin. And, and the priests themselves, although they, although they are especially consecrated before the Lord, there's this continual cleansing uh, that they must perform as part of their function uh, within the tabernacle. Now, we continue to read then in verse 22, the, the Lord said to Moses, take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels and of sweet smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is 250, and 250 of aromatic cane and 500 cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hin, which is about three and a half liters of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil with which you shall anoint the tent of meaning the ark of the testimony the table and all of its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all of its utensils and the basin and its stand you shall consecrate them that they be most holy and whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. So, so earlier on before this section, we, we, we've already talked about and worked through how the priests specifically were going to be consecrated or set apart for specific service within the tabernacle. And this, this anointing oil is going to be the oil that's supposed to be used for their consecration as well as the consecration or the setting apart to make holy uh, the instruments and the utensils and all the pieces of the service. It says, and you shall say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. Verse 32, it shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. Then the Lord says to Moses, take sweet spices, stacte and onicha and and galbanum, sweet spices, with pure frankincense, of each shall there be an equal part, and make an incense blended by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small, and put part of it before the testimony of the tent of meeting, where I shall meet with you, and it shall be most holy for you. In the incense that you shall make according to the composition, you shall not make for yourselves, it shall be for you, holy to the Lord, and whoever makes any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from his people. Again, there's specific instructions about the type of anointing oil and the type of incense that's to be used within the tabernacle structure. There are specific ingredients with specific instructions. This is a particular recipe uh, that's supposed to be used only for these purposes. It's not to be used for, for common purposes. It is holy. It's set apart. It is special uh, for a particular function. And the oil, again, is used for consecrating priests and the tabernacle tabernacle furniture. It smelled really nice. And the incense itself was going to be burnt on the altar and it was supposed to be kept burning all the time, just like the lamps were supposed to be kept burning all the time. It required now to, to, to make these things a lot of work, if you can imagine. They needed to find the plant. They needed to scrape the bark. Um, they needed to uh, measure out all the specific pieces of it, put it all together. I mean, this is not just a simple thing. You didn't run down to the 7-Eleven or the, uh, the corner store or whatever just to pick up, yeah, I'll get another, you know, kind of bottle of <laughs> incense uh, or another thing of incense or another bottle of anointing oil. I mean, there, there was a specific process uh, that had to be done in order to compose this and for it to be used. And so, so again, we, we see all the intimate details of this. And again, these pieces are to be sacred. They weren't for common use. And if they were used for common use, the Lord says there will be consequences that come as a result. And so, so what's being set up here through, through all of this discussion, whether it's um, the basin, the tax, the, the oil and the incense, all of this is about setting things apart for holy or for special, specific use. And 
And as you kind of take a look at the, even the tabernacle structure itself, this is kind of an artist rendering uh, of what we see. There's the outer courtyard. This would be the entrance into it. Um, you can kind of see the altar here, the tent of meeting in the back. Inside that would have been two different rooms. Um, so inside that tabernacle, the outer courtyard is 75 feet by 150 feet. And then the tent inside with the two sections is 15 feet by 45 feet long and 30 feet high. And inside this tabernacle are all the pieces of the furniture. And so you can kind of just a more plain view of it. Um, if this is the entrance to the tent, you can see the altar here. Uh, this is the basin that we just described that the priests would wash before entering into this tent of meeting or performing uh, their duties at this altar. Inside is the, the table uh, that held bread specifically for the priests. There was uh, the menorah or the candle holder um, and then the Ark of the Covenant and the other. So, so there's all all these pieces uh, that <clears throat> make up the furniture of the tabernacle structure. And, and, and along with that was all the priestly garments and their fine embroidery and the, the jewels that were, that were sewn into all the, pre, all the pieces. And so, so we have all the specific detail. And now the Lord says to Moses, I want to get started <laughs> on this project. And so starting at verse or chapter 31... Uh, we read these words. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting, and carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Oholiab, the son of As. Uh, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, the son of Asiamach of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded to you. That's the tent of meeting, and he goes on to list every other piece of furniture that's been described with all of its specific details uh, in these passages of Scripture. And so, so again, I love this about what the Lord does. He says, look, I have set apart specific people, and I'm going to call them by name. I filled them with my spirit. I've, I've made them smart. I've given them talents. I've given them specific skills that they're going to be able uh, to accomplish all that I'm asking you to do. And they're going to lead, and they're going to oversee all of this work according to its specific instructions. Now, and again, bigger picture, bigger purpose, all that we see is this, that, that what we've said consistently about the book of Exodus is, is that we see God's purpose and God's power and God's presence uh, demonstrated or on display through the whole thing. His purpose is gonna, he's going to form a nation of people wholly set apart that they would be a light to the world. And not only is his purpose going to be accomplished, but he's going to display his power and his might to overthrow kings and nations, to um, to, to control, um, kind of control the environment in which uh, the people are in, in terms of even from things like weather, thunder, lightning, earthquakes, all of that kind of stuff that God is powerful and sovereign over these things and that he uh, has the power to accomplish this and his power and his might is on display consistently throughout the exodus through the plagues and all the rest and not only that but God's presence is going to be with them specifically we see that um, in the fire uh, by night and the, uh, the cloud by day we see it uh, at the at Mount Sinai as God speaks to his people and now the view of the tabernacle uh, is coming into focus Focus, and this is going to be the place in which God is going to dwell with his people. And so the tabernacle then becomes a way of reminding the people that God is holy and that they or that even we are not. And even though we are not like God, that, that he is much greater, much different than us, that God will dwell with them and he will still make a way for people to enter into his presence. And so, so the end game about all of this is not religious activity. 
Although there seems to us that a lot, there's a lot of it, that there's a lot of religious activity taking place, all the specific instructions about how things are to function and what people are to wear and, and you know, where they can enter into and, and what's supposed to be done in this way and what the mixtures of these things are. Like there's a lot of what we would call religious activity involved in all of this, but the point is not the religious activity. The point is the presence of God with his people. And so we could look at all of this and say, uh, we might have some different perspectives. One person might say, well, this is absolutely impressive. Look at this. Like, it is sacred. It's extravagant. It's clean. It smells nice. I mean, this is, this is important stuff. This is Sunday best material, as it were. And and, 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 you know, we, we could have that perspective of these things, and that would be absolutely true. And yet, some might also have the perspective that, that it's so, so narrow, it's so legalistic, it's so, so, so much about the rules and the ceremony and the pomp and the circumstance, and if you don't get it right, like, you're dead. Like, that's kind of the idea. Like, like who can function? Who can live like that? Who would want to function and live like that? And I don't know what perspective you're coming at all of this from, but let me just kind of share this with us. Either way, whether we think this is impressive or whether we think it's narrow and so religious and ritualistic that, that we might lose the meaning in the midst of it, either way, our opinion about what it is doesn't really matter. Because at the end of the day, the point is that our way into the presence of God is not on our terms. It's on His terms. He's holy, we are not. And he's inviting us into relationship with him, but it's going to be on his terms. And for these people at this moment in history, this was the way into the presence of God. Now, you fast forward uh, a few hundred years and we find Jesus speaking in John chapter 14, kind of uh, in those last uh, few moments before uh, he's going to be betrayed and led away and crucified. Jesus speaking to his disciples is, is offering them comfort uh, during that Passover meal. And he says this in John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, these are bold, bold claims. Jesus doesn't say, I am a way. To God, I am part of the truth. Like you may or may not find, you know, joy of life in me. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And then he makes this exclusive claim. No one comes to the Father except through me. What a bold statement. Because for those disciples in the room and for every Jewish person alive on earth in that day, the way into the presence of God was through the temple, through the sacrificial system, through all of the, um, through all of the ritual and ceremony of the sacrificial system. And yet in this moment, Jesus redefines how it is that we are going to find our way into the presence of God. And he says, it is through me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. The way into the presence of God, which is what we need the most in our lives, is only going to be through Jesus, believing in his life, death, and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins and life with God being ushered into our presence. Why? Because Jesus is God with us. He is our ransom, our cleansing, our high priest, and he is always home. And the only way for us to enter into the very presence of God is through Jesus. Now, back to Exodus for a moment, chapter 31, as we pick up. Uh, then in verse 12, we're going to get into something uh, just it kind of takes a bit of a shift in direction. Now, there's been all this activity described. There's been all these things. There's going to be all this work to do, all this stuff to accomplish. There's plans drawn up. It's got to be all, des it's, got, it's all designed. It's got to be um, kind of worked and carved and, and set. And, and there's a ton of work ahead to be done. And just before the Lord sends Moses back down the mountain with these blueprints for the tabernacle, tabernacle and all of its pieces. This is what we read in chapter 31, starting at verse 12. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above 
all. In other words, pay attention because I know there's a lot of work to accomplish and I know there's a lot that you're going to be caught up in and I know there's a lot you're going to be giving your attention to. He says, but above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. A time and a period of rest. This is the fourth commandment of the ten that he's already given. It's rooted in creation itself, but God worked for the first six days, and then he rested on the seventh. And God says to them, I expect the same of you, that you're going to work, and you're going to work hard. But every seventh day, you need to take a break. You need to have a rest. And so above all, with all this work that's going to be done, you shall keep my Sabbath. For this is a sign, he says, between me and you throughout your generation. There are signs of covenants before with Abraham, and now the sign of the Mosaic covenant is going to be this, that you will keep the Sabbath, and that's going to be the sign, that's going to be the symbol that you are set apart and different through all your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. The reminder here is that that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You don't sanctify yourselves. I sanctify you. I set you apart for specific use. I purify you from your sins. I make you legitimate in my sight. It's not through your effort and your work and your accomplishment that you're going to find acceptance by me, that, that you are accepted because of me and my work sanctifying you. And so here's what he's saying. Amidst all the work you're going to do, take a day off. Work six, but stop in seven. And then the command escalates even further. It says this, everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. I mean, that, this is a serious consequence. Whoever does any work on it on the Sabbath, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And he goes on to say this, that six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout the generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. You see, this is, this is a serious issue. Now, part of this, we read in Deuteronomy, the reason for the Sabbath in part is because they're coming out of a place of Sabbath, or coming out of a place of sab- slavery, excuse me, that, that they're used to work, work, work. It's work all the time. It's make more bricks. As a slave, you don't get time off. You don't get holidays, uh, vacation time to go away. It's work and work and work. And your value is determined by your productivity. That's the 400 years of slavery and that mindset that's been ingrained into this generation of people as they come out. And God says, time out. That's going to stop. We're not perpetuating that model. You are going to take a break every seventh day. And that's that's going to be a sign of the covenant that I'm making with you. Things are going to change. And here becomes the temptation in the midst of it. The temptation for the people is that their work would be the source of their fulfillment rather than God himself. You catch that? The the temptation with all of this work is that, that their work is going to be a source of fulfillment for them and not God himself. Of course, we would never do anything like that today now, would we? I mean, work is good. It is from God. In fact, there were instructions given to Adam and to Eve in, the, in their innocence and creation to, 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 to take care of the garden and to, you know, to fill the earth and subdue it and to rule over it. And, and there was work to be done. And so work is not a curse. For some of us, we think of work as like the thing that we do so that we can live. But, but there's great fulfillment that can be found in work. In fact, work is part of our design and makeup. There should be things that we work at and there is some sense of fulfillment in it, but it should not be the source of our fulfillment. Work is good, and it is from God, but it makes a terrible God. And God wasn't going away if they were to take a break, if they were to rest. In fact, God would continue to work while they rested. And so the temptation becomes, man, all this work has got to be done. There's so much to do. There's an endless amount to it that that we'll never get it done. We just got to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And God says, no, no, no. Remember, above all of that, you will take a break. I did it. 
you will too. And not only that, but then there's the other side of the issue that, that could become the problem as well. Because instead of the Sabbath being a, a generous gift that's to be received well as, as something God has designed and given for us that we might find rest from our work, that we might know and find our fulfillment in God himself. The problem is that we can then become, we can very quickly and easily twist the meaning of Sabbath um, and the purpose of Sabbath and make Sabbath, in fact, another work that we must do. You know what I mean? So, so like we become so consumed with how Sabbath is supposed to be and what we're supposed to do on Sabbath and not supposed to do on Sabbath, that that, that in, in itself becomes a uh, work. Sabbath was meant by God to be a release for us and a rest, but, but oh, how quickly it can also become a burden. In fact, in Luke chapter 13, uh, we see this play out in a very specific uh, way as Jesus is teaching um, in a synagogue. And Luke tells us in verse 13, now, Jesus, he is Jesus. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Now, that was normal. Instruction, religious instruction happened in synagogues on the Sabbath. That, that was part of worship was part of uh, what, what Sabbath was about. It was, you know, it was part of the rest. It's a focus on God. It's a reminder. All of those things. But it says now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Now, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, particularly when, when one of the Gospel writers introduces to us that Jesus did something on the Sabbath, it's usually a cue that something's going to go sideways and somebody's going to have a problem or an issue. Why? Because, because they'd taken the purpose of Sabbath and it was no longer a release, but it became a burden. And so as Jesus is teaching, it says, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. This is a long time. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And so so she has, been, she has been sick and under this condition for a long time, for 18 years. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, notice he has such compassion toward this woman who's in such a dehabilitating state. And he says to her, woman, he does, the first thing he says, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. In other words, she, she gets thanks. She probably sang a song. She probably started to dance. You know, she's just celebrating because 18 years of this disability is all of a sudden removed by, by the words of Jesus himself, and she's glorifying God, but the ruler of the synagogue, in other words, the one who was responsible for, for all the, uh, that happened in the synagogue, the overseer of the synagogue, made decisions, um, had people read, you know, would, would, you know, facilitate the function of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue became indignant, which is a very strong word for, for like angry, and, and so he becomes indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Now, of all the reasons to be upset, it's because he healed on the Sabbath and it says this, he said to the people, this is what the ruler of the synagogue says, there are six days in which work ought to be done. So he's quoting now this Old Testament, right? You'll do all your work in six days, but there is going to be a day of rest. Six days which work can be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Now this is, to us kind of at face value, we might look at it and go, this is absolutely ridiculous. Did you just see what happened? Jesus healed this woman who'd been dehabilitated for 18 years, and now he's healed her. And the only thing you can think of is it's the Sabbath. You should have came on a different day of the week? And that's exactly Jesus' reaction. He says to them, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Like, don't you do those kinds of things? Don't you care for your own animals each day? I mean, this year we got chickens. We got four chickens up in our yard. And, and every morning we got to go out. We got to open up the coop, let the chickens out, collect the eggs that are there. Um, we got to make sure that they got water, that they got food. Um, you know, we make sure the, the door's shut every night. We don't, we don't take a day off from doing that. And Jesus said, look, <clears throat> don't you care for your own barnyard animals uh, in this way? He says, ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan and bound for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Isn't this ridiculous? You've missed the point. To you, he says, the problem is this, that the Sabbath had become a burden and not a release. 
As he said these things, all of his adversaries, it says, were put to shame and all the people rejoiced and all the glorious things that were done by him. So, so what is it that, that we need to pay attention to with all of this today? I, I, would, I want to draw this conclusion for us on Labor Day. And that you and I need a rhythm of work and of rest. You and I need a rhythm of work and of rest because rest was never meant to be a burden. And I know for so many of us, when we think about the speed of life, that, that we lack sleep, we're consistently busy, we're constantly connected to our devices. Um, you know, there's just this continual influx of information that our, that our brains just can't even begin to, our brains can't even, you know, deal with all of it all the time. And so, so, so we're just constantly inundated through that connection, through the endless list of things that needs to be done. We're always busy. We're always, you know, running kids here and there. We lack sleep. We don't sleep well. We, you know, we drink lots of coffee because we think that's going to be the thing that, that keeps us going. And, and look, here's the reality that for many people, long days and long hours are what gets rewarded. Isn't that true? Like in the workplace, if you work long and you work hard, isn't that what the boss tends to notice? That, that, man, you're putting in the hours and you're committed and that's, you know, that's going to be what it takes. That those things get celebrated. And, and I'm not saying working hard is, is not a bad thing. I'm not saying there's that, that, that look, there are seasons in our lives where we've got to work hard and sometimes we've got to work long. But if we don't take a break, that's going to be to our own demise. And, and in fact, science and scientific research and neuroscience and sleep patterns and, and all, this kinds of, all these kinds of studies and things are now telling us what God told us a long time ago, that we work hard, but we need to take a rest. And just full disclosure, <laughs> me, I am not good at this. I'm just not. I, I don't rest well. I don't sit well. I don't do nothing well. Some people seem to be able to do that really easy. I don't. I find it so hard, and, and I'm not good in this, and part of that's self-imposed. I mean, I recognize within myself that, that my tendency sometimes is to find my value in, in not only my productivity, Right? And, and how much I can produce and, and, and how hard I work, but, but also in my performance and how well I do it. I mean, those are kind of, those things can be good things that it pushes me to, to, to exceed and to, you know, to do my best and to be productive and, and to perform well. I want to do those things, and that's not necessarily bad, but, but when that becomes the thing that I most value, if I find my own personal value in performance and productivity, that's not healthy. And those are things that I I personally need to guard against. And I'm just, to be honest, I've not done well with that at all. These instructions, this rhythm of work and rest that, that, was, that was spoken of by God to Moses for the people that, that, look, work hard, yes, but you need to take a break. I've not been doing well with that, to be completely honest. In fact, since March the first up until the end of July, when I, when I went on vacation of those five months, those, those two, sorry, 147 days, in that span of time, there were only six days where I did nothing work-related. So just full-out confession, like, I need help with this. Th this isn't something that comes easy to me, and I've felt the effects of it. Man, it took me a long time on vacation to begin to catch up, at least to where I should start to be. And so, so going into this fall, I mean, I got to reevaluate some things myself, but, but here's some suggestions for you. If you're anything like me and if you're having trouble with this work and rest rhythm and if you're just the constant go-getter and you're not stopping because there's always something to do or always expectations to be had and you find it hard to rest and to stop and to pause and recognize that, that your value is not determined by your performance and your productivity, but, but who you belong to. And if you belong to God and to Jesus, your value is determined by his sanctifying of you, not by what you perform for him. So I encourage you with just three quick things. One is, is you got to find things that you need to stop doing. Now, now some people need to start doing some things, but, but, but again, if you're having a hard job finding this rest, you got to determine, you got to predetermine what you're going to stop doing because being able to say no to something allows you to say yes to something 
else. And, and you got to figure out what it is you have to stop doing. And you got to regularly reassess through various seasons and times in your life where you got to reevaluate when things start to get a little out of hand, a little out of control, or it's a different season and you know there's different expectations, summer, back to school, you know, whatever it is. You got to stop and reevaluate. And yes, yeah, some seasons are busier than others where, where your work, maybe if you're a lobster fisherman, you're going to be going hard for a little while, but you still need to take that rest in the moments in between. So you got to figure out and pre-decide what you're going to stop doing. That's the first thing. Second thing I would say is this, is that you have to pay attention to your own soul. You have to pay attention to what's going on inside of you because it's so easy to be busy. And sometimes we're, we're busy to the point that we neglect our own selves and what God wants to do and to birth in our hearts. And, and we get so distracted by all the things going on that, that we're not paying attention to what God wants to say to us. And so we need to find time to, to, to be in the presence of God. Jesus said, you must abide in me. And so whether that's more emphasis on prayer, more emphasis on reading scripture, having that quiet time, whether it's engaging in worship more frequently, whether it's, it's finding a small community, a small group of people that you can kind of surround yourself with to be accountable to, and all of those things. But, but it needs to be centered on Jesus because you must pay attention to your own soul. And you work out of a place then, when, when we do that, we begin to work out of a place of already being accepted by God and not striving for his acceptance. And then finally, not only do we need to stop, not only do we need to pay attention to our own souls, but we also need to find the right rhythms in our lives. Whether that's daily, weekly, monthly, seasonally, annually, whatever those rhythms are, but in the process, make sure you actually take your vacation date, that if you need to take a mental health day, that you find ways that you can work out that that can happen, that you get your sleep, that you're not just functioning and running exhausted all the time. Why? Because you need a rhythm of work and of rest. Because that, finding rest, taking a nap, being still before the Lord, paying attention to your own soul, saying no to some things, sometimes that's the most important or the most spiritual thing that we can do. Above all the rest, because yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot to put our hands to, and there's a lot that the Lord wants to do in and through us, but He also says above we work hard, that we put our hands to a whole bunch, and we're excited about what it is that the Lord has for us to do, but in the process that above all those things, 